I have a handful of auto runs that have been set up and installed by malware. And I mean auto run in that it will automatically run and execute and invoke code just as the user logs in or the computer starts up and it's set up as a persistence mechanism for threat actors, adversaries, hackers, and malware. Now, this is the syntax. In fact, I have each of these on different lines. These are all different auto runs that have been set up and staged on different compromised Windows hosts. Each individual endpoint had their own unique little stager here set up as a scheduled task or service. However, they might set up this hook and claw for an auto run and persistence. Let me grab one of these just as an example, something for us to look at, explore and understand. And you might already know all the things that are included here. You can see that there is a semicolon over at the end here that indicates this is two commands or two specific instructions that are being ran. And these are invoked likely with the Windows command prompt, cmd.exe. In fact, this erlar string here, that bit of text surrounded by these two percent signs indicates that it is a variable, something that might have a value already set for it. In fact, the way that I would envision this actually being invoked is if this erlar variable and all the others that we might have seen are set up as an environment variable. So they don't need to be declared or set as a machine starts up. They're already configured and this syntax on its own will fire the gun. We do see some other arguments, parameters included or flags, switches, whatever you want to call them with a dash hyphen or tack, tack W with the value of one. Now this doesn't exactly clue us in as to what Erlar might be, but if we keep reading on in the syntax, we get a better idea because the 2% signs denoting a variable in cmd.exe, well, a dollar sign could very well represent with the prefix being set as a variable for PowerShell, powershell.exe. We see a variable being set to something and then the subsequent command that's run, erlar once again, to invoke whatever it could be, presumably PowerShell, with that value. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this is a little bit interesting because even if this were staged with an environment variable, so that already has something set for our erlar or whatever or any of these might happen to be, staging this PAMP134 variable and then using a semicolon to trigger something else with that same variable seemed like it would just lose its scope here because this seems to be one subshell of potentially PowerShell and then invoked later on. Thus far, I've been recording in Remnux, the reverse engineering malware Linux distribution, but I think we can hop over to Windows and take a look as to if that actually comes to life. If our hypothesis is true, there is a command prompt being ran, executed with whatever variable that was presumably staged with an environment variable, let's say Erlar, but that could, at least for our proof of concept, just be a variable. And we'll call that, really set that, just variable being the name, PowerShell being the value, in which case, if it were to try and invoke something using variable wrapped in two percent signs, tack W1 for one thing is really going to end up meaning that this is a minimized window. You'll note that it just took away my terminal and command prompt, if I open it back up, it did invoke PowerShell, but immediately minimize the window. I know that was full screen, so not super duper visible, but let's see that again, minimizes itself. So that tack W tells us that is the window style argument for PowerShell. But if we have this stage and we actually told it, look, I want you to set another var to be equal to something that it could actually invoke and run like a simple write host hello output, hello world example. Let's just do a write host hello. And then actually staging that with a subsequent semicolon to say, let's invoke PowerShell again via our first variable set via the environment variables with the value of var. Does that actually work? Let me minimize or take this out of full screen and let this minimize itself. I'll hit enter here and you saw it maybe for just a second there, but it did invoke that code, even knowing it after or before some other semicolon. I thought that was interesting, honestly. It was just a simple little question of scope. Anyway, I'm rambling. What we're really most interested in is what is actually being invoked. What is the value of this PAMP134 variable or even any of the others that are all staged and set up in the exact same way for all of these auto runs. What this variable is being set to is actually the get item property PowerShell commandlet with a path being passed in as an argument for HKCU and then 
chauvinist in this case, dot diddy ram. In fact, a whole lot of the others are seemingly random, obviously different variable names and even different components as part of the path that it's pulling out of HKCU. Post num, arrow select, unangular 69, okay. Hopping back over to Windows for just a quick second, you might be familiar with the Windows registry. If I were to fire up reg edit, hey, the registry editor, that HKCU is actually referring to the registry hive, HKEY current user. You know the Windows registry, like hey, tons of configurations and settings for the Windows operating system. The HKEY current user is an interesting location because it refers to you, the current user, whether you're local admin or Joe Schmo, whatever user account you might be, you typically have right access and permission to work in HKEY current user because it's referring to you. So this is a certain example of fileless malware, at least kind of the buzzword, what folks tend to say, oh, they're hiding a subsequent payload, secondary, tertiary, whatever next stage in their attack chain, not on a file on disk, on the hard drive or in your file system, but in the Windows registry. If we actually were to take a look back at the syntax, we get item property, HKCU, HKEY current user, for chauvinist as an example, and then dot diddy ram, or some other value pulled out of the registry. And then we use presumably PowerShell again to invoke and execute that, just like we did with that right host example. So the question then becomes, what is in that HKEY current user? What is that value? And what is PowerShell going to invoke as part of this malware strain? Before we fall down the rabbit hole on that, I'd love to tell you a little bit about the sponsor of today's video. AnyRun is a live and interactive dynamic malware sandbox, all within your browser. You can analyze threats instantly, download the latest detailed reports, and easily spin up the latest operating systems for testing, like Windows 10 or 11 in either 32-bit or 64-bit architecture. Got a sample of malware you want to see in action? Need to easily share findings with your colleagues or members of your team? You can choose the privacy setting of tasks, and you can customize just about every part of the sandbox. Between the starting directory of your malware sample, web browsers and applications installed, and even network proxies like Tor or VPN or other geolocations. I use AnyRun personally for quick and easy analysis to immediately see what a malware sample does on a live system. You've probably seen it all over my videos. It tracks open and running processes, network connections and DNS requests, and behavior heuristics to identify a sample. You can rapidly pull out a process graph, check indicators of compromise, view tradecraft with a MITRE attack matrix, and even generate a report or download a sample. Within just a few seconds, you have answers to your research. AnyRun is committed to make the process of malware research easy, fast, and efficient for specialists by simplifying their work. You can try AnyRun for free with my link below in the video description. Huge thanks to AnyRun for sponsoring this video. Let me draw the picture a little bit more for you. Again, if we were in our registry, say there were a new key for whatever the malware decided to call, I don't know, chauvinist or something stupid, if that were a created key, there could be a new value present in there called Diddy Ram or whatever the heck it was with whatever value set to run any sort of malicious PowerShell, write host, please subscribe, anything you want. Now, from some of the investigations, I was able to pull down some of the registry values that were present there. In the malware file list directory that I have, I do have chauvinist, our unangular 69, and arrow select. Let's start with chauvinist because that is kind of what we've been chatting about. I know it's silly for me to keep saying that over and over again, but let's fire that up. I have this name with a .ps1 extension because again, we're presuming this is PowerShell and at actually looking at this sample, it seems to be PowerShell code. First things first, it starts with a DIR, which is odd, uh, not really necessary. And again, this is in a minimized window, but let's start to clean this up. It is presented just as a giant blob of nonsense, but we could manually deobfuscate this. There's not a lot here. And in fact, the deobfuscation isn't all that complex. What I like to do is just replace semicolons with a semicolon new line, new line. So it's a little bit more beautified and we can make sense as to what each of the different subsequent commands are. We do have a function being declared up here, fanglet nine, okay. Takes in a parameter, seren freels, whatever that might be, with the variable being set to the value five and then incremented. 
Then we start a for loop with the semicolons being broken here to denote each sort of part of the for loop. But we could rebuild this. All we simply do is, hey, bring this back to life with the curly braces all in mind. And then we have some other variables that come to life with, hey, maybe components of commandlets, hey, pieces that we would like to run. We gotta be very careful though, if we actually note where the closing curly brace is, that will tell us, okay, that's the end of our for loop that we see a variable returned out, probably just the return value of this function, and then the closing curly brace to denote that's the end of the function. Again, not super hard in that case, just kind of ignoring all the noise, nonsense, and randomly named variables, and just taking apart indicators that tell us what the language might be doing. This fanglet function is presumably called a couple more times, seemingly to stage other parts of the script, some staging variables, and actually ampersand invoking a couple of these. That works oftentimes like an invoke expression or IEX for a lot of PowerShell code. So we'll take note of that, but ultimately we should see what that fanglet function does. We do have an if statement in the mix here, and then actually another invoked curly brace for some logic, else, interesting random semicolon there. Shouldn't really do anything, but the rest of this logic would be inside of that else block. We can keep building these together and then we'll find a while loop with a little bit more logic inside the curly brace, more fanglet calls, a couple more invocations, and eventually we see the end of that while loop. Way down here, we're closing out to the end of our else statement. Cleaning this up just a little bit more, but it really looks like fanglet is the breadcrumb and puzzle piece that we need to make sense of this script. Otherwise, it looks like a lot of nonsense, but fanglet, that function at the very top here, looks to be the secret. If you'd like, we can rename these variables. We can call this like unravel or something stupid. The parameter that's passed in, I am using regular expressions in Sublime Text, so I'll need to escape with a backslash for the dollar sign there. We can just call that like first arg. And then we have the value first set to five and then incremented set to six. So let's just rename that to like six. <laughs> Then we have our for loop iterator. That can just really be the letter I if we wanted to denote, okay, our incrementing thing. So we start at the value five while we are less than the length of the argument minus one and we keep adding six. Eventually we build out a substring concatenated together. So this could simply be substring and that it looks like some other variable down below takes the first argument, uses substring, invoking it at the current position and one following that. So it's literally getting, what is it, every sixth character of the string starting from the first fifth one? Well, I guess it's zero base indexing, right? So that would still be the sixth character. We can rename that variable to just sixth character. And then we're building out a returned string that we see at the very, very end. Now, ultimately, all this function does, our unravel or fanglet nine just gets every six characters of a presented string. So that means that all of the values that we see down below really aren't all that interesting to us because again, we can disregard all the nonsense and noise. We just need all of these sixth characters. Thankfully, our function does that. So if we'd like, now that we kind of understand how this all comes together, if we trust, look, only these functions, these actual commands and instructions aren't executing anything, but just storing them as variables, then we could just let the code unravel and evaluate itself. The latter lines with the ampersand will actually invoke something, so we'll add a little bit more guardrails to that. But at the very start, let's go see what these things are. Let me build out like a playground script. Let me copy what we'd like so far and then just save this into another, we'll call it literally playground.ps1, save that. And then we can go ahead and write host to simply display what each of these variables are. Nothing fancy, just trying to see, hey, what did this unravel or deobfuscate to be? Write host, write host, write host. And with that, we could actually invoke trusting and allowing this to run still within Linux, right? I'm in Remnux. So I'm not super duper worried of it actually doing any malicious stuff, but we could fire up PowerShell. Oh, we actually have a new version. Okay. Anyway, let's try to run our playground.ps1. Fingers crossed, no errors. Ooh, okay. So the first value goes to a URL, expeditionbuilders.com <laughs> slash jkmemo.cur. Is that like a cursor file? Next one is IEX, the commandlet PowerShell alias for invoke expression. And then 
Megura thing, weirdness there. So we could put these values in our script and now we have a better understanding of what's going on where. Let's actually bring this back to our original script and then we could just actually put these in the values that might be worthwhile. Return string zero one should simply be IEX and then Brevig, that was this randomness. I'm not sure if that's useful for us. Let's put that there just so we can see these values. And now everything that had an ampersand, again, that is a landmine. That is will actually invoke, detonate, fire, and run some of the code here. So let me remove those, change those to simply write host so we can echo out the value and see what it might try to do. In fact, that return string 01, IEX in the mix, is actually what's gonna end up firing it off. So we could remove that and just see what the unravel deobfuscation would do for us. We can clean those up, we got a couple of them. But now we're getting a couple more puzzle pieces to be able to see what the code really does here. Let me put these back into our playground.ps1 so that way we can go ahead and execute this. We're trusting that that will simply just write host after unraveled. And then we have some new variables stage. Let's copy and take a look at these. So everything that we copied previously, we can replace with this. And presumably we get an actual environment variable for Winder, the Windows directory. And bumping over to Windows, I believe that should be, if we actually echo out env winder, it's just the C backslash windows directory. Now, because there is more nested code here in other unraveled and IEX invoke things, I don't really wanna change the variable names because it might desync, quote unquote, as to what we would see in our script as we work through it and what is in the rest of the subsequent nested code that's evaluated. It'll still be using the old OG variable names, so that wouldn't super duper help us. Interesting though, that Brevig variable that we saw above with whatever randomness is actually being added on to our C backslash Windows directory. So is this going to be used as a file or for some write output location? Then we get the current process command line split on, what is that character 34? We can take a look in PowerShell. That is simply the single quote, oh, double quote, okay. Why would we get the current process split on double quotes? Is that just to get PowerShell? Cheap and I, that's a variable. So I'm, is it trying to determine the instance? We could actually just run this, right? I'm not, I'm not worried about anything happening there. GWMI is to get a Windows management instrumentation, like some Windows specific stuff and the classes for WMI. So we will need to invoke that on Windows. Let me hop back over there. We'll clean out our PowerShell window and, oh, let me copy the full thing. Paste that in. What is our televisor thing? Oh, okay. It's just pulling the actual value of PowerShell. So that way we can make sure that that's the real path, I guess. And then we do something interesting. We test path Brevig, which was our C Winder whatever nonsense, and int pointer size eight. That's normally used to detect if it's a 64-bit or 32-bit architecture. In which case, hey, we're testing if that already exists. Because if it does, then we dot to invoke it with PowerShell, Brevig that. So if it were invoking this, Brevig would probably be an executable, maybe our malware from our URL, memo.cur or whatever, uh, but that's only if it exists. So it's using, the malware family is using this as a guard to see whether it has already executed and invoked on this target already. If not, our else statement, then we'll need to go unravel all of this stuff. Remember, these are landmines, so we'll need to replace those with write host. We can get a quick idea for what these are. We'll do the same with the return string zero. Let's actually just put these in our playground and let me add another write host here. Oh, this write host needs to actually have parentheses around it. That way it'll invoke. Give me the value dot playground. Oh, start bits transfer. So absolutely downloading something from our source synopsize, which we saw as like that URL, right? That was the HTTP, hey, actual online location. Destination for do say two. And then we put that into app data, import module bits transfer. Interesting. So putting all this back in, ultimately we are starting a download, our four to set two, whatever, which is where we had our Brevig big random path, presumably adding in another value for Anki.q. That's probably going to end up being a file, right? Well, not whatever this is, where did this come from? 
Oh shoot, did we clobber that variable? We totally should have put this in a uh, modified file because I want to bring myself all the way back to where we started. And now let me see if I have that variable. Um, let me go back to modified. I don't think that ever even existed. Did we see that in the output? Did you see that? Am I dumb? While not a variable that doesn't exist is going to end up being true, in which case while true means it'll run forever and ever. So we invoke once again, this is a stupid invoke expression. So let's clean that with right host. Let's unravel and see what those things are. Let's get these. I don't think that we'll end up getting anything from our return string zero, zero. I think that was the like actual value as it proceeds through the bits transfer download, right? Let's go ahead and run that. Oh, okay. It's checking to see if it exists and then sleeping over and over. So it's certainly downloading. There's that variable that we were trying to track down earlier. It looks like it is being actually invoked, created, set up and staged within the while loop. And we're finally at the end here. So let me right host these. We end up with a new variable clanginzer, which probably comes from these actually invoke statements. So if we slap that into our playground, then we can see what that really does. Fanglet, ooh, new fanglet, ends up getting the value that was downloaded, actually base64 decoding it, turning it into ASCII and then going ahead and probably invoking it, yep, 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 with a substring component here. Interesting. That is, at the end of the day, a downloader to stage and run more PowerShell from this location, uh, expeditionbuilders.com jkmemo.cur. This is pulled down with a bits transfer. I'm curious if we could just do it. Does that still even exist? Is that domain online is my next question, right? Let's put this into our playground, actually stage that as a variable. Can I use bits transfer in Linux? I don't know. How about output.log? Let's just see, will that run in PowerShell on Linux? I don't know. Nope, okay, totally not. Let's bounce back over to Windows and see if we can pull that down. Do it. Will that work? I hit enter, it's supposed to be doing its thing. Takes a little bit of time. Okay, it's going. Does that actually exist? Is that file still up? Uh, presumably. We have an output.log. Oh, it's empty. Okay, dang it. Yeah, even if I use that URL, I like to try to use the same download methodology that the sample uses, because if we were to do something in like curl, whatever user agent might be different and maybe the server won't respond to it, but I don't think even that works. What does curl vvvvv tell me? Is it alive? Is it up? It apparently has a certificate, expeditionbuilders.com, but it just didn't return anything. Huh. Well, honestly, that is okay, because we didn't need to fall down the rabbit hole any further on that malware. We figured, okay, it'll download, invoke something new, but that's not really the focus that I wanted right now. Hey, this is John from the future. Uh, I was editing this video and let me let you in on a little bit of a secret, a little bit of a fun fact. There is about like 30 more minutes or so, maybe 15 or 20 minutes if we trim it down of extra footage where I fell down a little bit of a rabbit hole and I wanted to try something clever that I thought, hey, maybe a little bit of a trick, some technique for either host hardening or prevention to uh, maybe add a little countermeasure and break or stop, mitigate some portion of this attack chain. Like the malware family, like we saw in the persistence, was pulling down a payload in another stage from the registry. Windows registry, HK current user, HKCU. So I was thinking, what if we added some ACL, like access control list, and made it so the user, Joe Schmo, Alice, Bob, Doug, whatever, would no longer be able to actually write or create sub keys in HKCU because it wouldn't make sense. I don't think they really need to do that for work that they would naturally do if they're just a normal end user using their computer doing their thing. And I did that. Hey, we wrote some PowerShell code. We would loop through all of the local users and then add the access control so they could not write or create drives strictly in the HKCU, the absolute root of that hive, because I had a hunch that maybe inheritance or something funneling down to other nested keys would probably break something, right? Hey, whether you're installing software or you're doing something in 
your user account, but the absolute tippy top root of HKCU is probably fine to add some restrictions and limit the permissions on. That's what I thought, and it seemed to work well. It would block oh, creating an, a new sub key and maybe that malware couldn't stage its next location. But um, that was until I tried to reboot that virtual machine. Trying to sign in to that low privilege user, well, uh, it, it would break group policy, user-based group policy, and you could no longer log in, and that was a horrible idea that completely ruined and broke and destroyed that user account. So I was wrong, I was forgetting something that would break from that clever idea. Um, whoops. <laughs> if you're interested, I don't know, I feel like that's not all that valuable. I didn't want to put that out there because really I would gotta say, do not do that, that's a bad idea, don't try that. But if you'd like to see some of that footage, I guess I can upload it as some like unlisted video if that's interesting for you. But seriously, I need to put the disclaimer, do not do that, it's a bad idea. <laughs> With that said, this isn't exactly like my, uh, th this isn't what I would have wanted for the ending of a video where, look, the malware that we were getting to poke and play at, uh, their online or external, you know, third party resource to pull down the next stage isn't online anymore. That wasn't returning what we would have liked. So, bit of a bummer, but I was still hoping and I still think that, hey, the footage and the, the video as it is so far might still be worthwhile and valuable to you. And maybe just that anecdote, noting, look, sometimes that malware isn't gonna have that online anymore, and some of the research, some of the antics, some of the fun stuff could just absolutely be a complete failure, and, uh, you know, that's just how it is sometimes. But I hope you enjoyed some light PowerShell deobfuscation. Thank you so much for watching. I know it's again really weird, crappy to end the video on that, but hey, please do those YouTube algorithm things, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.